Recall that there are two basic parts to any solution. One of them is the solvent. Something like water. And then there's something that gets dissolved in the solvent, which we call the solute. And that could be something like sodium chloride, which then separates into ions in solution. All right, and, but we need to talk about solubility, which is how much of that solute will dissolve in that solvent. And solubility can be looked up for various substances, for instance, for sodium chloride in water. The solubility is listed as 39 grams per 100 milliliters of water. And that's always at some temperature, um, and it might and it varies some with temperature. If you look up silicon dioxide in something like the chem, uh, Handbook of Chemistry and Physics, you'll find a little I symbol, meaning it's insoluble in water. In other words, it has no measurable solubility. So while sodium chloride dissolves well in water, silicon dioxide does not. And you can see that when you go to the ocean. There's plenty of salt in the water, dissolved in the water, you can taste it. But silicon dioxide, which is the main component of sand, is not dissolved in the water. It's on the beaches lying there, not dissolving in the water. But what determines that sodium chloride dissolves in water and silicon dioxide does not? Well, it turns out the main thing is intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces govern what dissolves in what and to what extent. And one of the main um, things we use to describe whether something will dissolve or not is the phrase, like dissolves like. And what this means is that things with similar intermolecular forces will dissolve in other things with those intermolecular forces. For example, this um, zigzag here represents the hydrocarbon hexane, which has six carbons. This other zigzag represents octane. Both of these are nonpolar substances, and so they actually dissolve very readily in each other because their intermolecular forces are similar, which is dispersion forces. So you can dissolve hexane into octane or vice versa quite readily because they are both nonpolar. Now let's look at dissolving oil and water. Okay, water, as you know, is a bent molecule, very polar, and it has hydrogen bonding. So we'll put some waters in one container. Oil, on the other hand, like hexane and octane, is a long chain of hydrocarbons, which I'm going to represent by just sticks, and those are nonpolar. Now, if I want to mix oil and water, you probably know the result. They don't mix too well. The water will go to the bottom. And the oil will sit on top. Okay, you know this if you try to make oil and vinegar salad dressing. They separate readily. We know this from looking at oil spills on the ocean. The oil makes a layer on top of the water. They do not mix because they have very different intermolecular forces. All right, so from this we can see that, um, or we can deduce that oil, which is nonpolar, will also dissolve other nonpolar species, such as hexane and octane. And water, on the other hand, will dissolve polar molecules like itself, especially small polar molecules like itself, and also ions, because it is so polar that ions also dissolve in it readily. Okay, we can use this kind of information to answer lots of questions about what will dissolve in what. So let's look at this one, the first one. Sodium chloride will dissolve better in which of these two solvents? If you look at those two, they both have an OH on them, which tells you that they both have hydrogen bonding. All right, but which one will it dissolve better in? They will dissolve somewhat in both, 
but it will dissolve better in one that is more like it, meaning more polar, and that would be methanol, which has not so much of a hydrocarbon part because hydrocarbons are nonpolar. This one, while it does have an OH, has a longer hydrocarbon part, so it's going to have a little bit of nonpolar character to it, so sodium chloride dissolves better in the first one. How about this molecule with hydrogen bonding? It has OH groups. Will it dissolve better in this long hydrocarbon or water? Okay, hopefully you see that with OH on there, it's much more like water. It will dissolve in water, which is polar. This is a nonpolar substance that is polar. Which of these two will dissolve in water better? This hydrocarbon chain with an OH on it or this hydrocarbon chain with two OHs on it? Notice both of these are a four carbon hydrocarbon chain, so we can compare them. So this second molecule has two hydrogen bonding groups for the four carbons. The first one only has one. So the second one has more hydrogen bonding and will be more like water. Which dissolves in water better? One, which of these two molecules? Carbon tetrachloride or this molecule with three chlorines and one hydrogen. If you draw them out, you'll see that carbon tetrachloride is nonpolar, whereas the other one, you replace one of these chlorines with an H, which makes gives it a polarity, so it's polar. So which will dissolve in water better? The polar one. All right, and then we can ask other questions like this multiple choice question. Like dissolves like means two substances will form a solution if they have similar what? And hopefully you can readily say intermolecular forces. And our final question on this page is, what's the strongest intermolecular force between acetone, drawn here, and acetylene, drawn here? The question you want to ask yourself is, what are the intermolecular forces that they have? Are they polar? Are they nonpolar? Are they ions? If you look at acetone, hopefully you'll identify that as a polar substance, which means it has a dipole. If something's polar, it has a dipole. If you look at acetylene, you should be able to tell that it's nonpolar, and therefore it has no dipole but it can be induced to have a dipole. So if you had something with a dipole, something with no dipole, you would call that dipole, induced dipole forces between them. The acetone has a dipole, the acetylene gets an induced dipole. All right, now we can use some of the things we've just talked about to talk about soap. And we'll also talk about capsaicin, because both of those two have a lot to do with intermolecular forces. So soap looks vaguely like this drawing here, where the zigzag represents a long hydrocarbon chain. So it has a very long nonpolar end. And it has this end with two um, oxygens on it, which is a polar end. So to some extent, it's a comparison between the two ends. The long nonpolar end, turns out it will dissolve a lot of things that are related to grease or, or oil because they are nonpolar. So the nonpolar end will dissolve things in your clothing or in your dishes that you want to dissolve, like dirt and grease. So it dissolves nonpolar dirt and grease, which is what you want to get off, say, your laundry. Whereas the polar end allows it to um, hydrogen bond to water or to um, at least dipole, at least it has an, an ion part and it has oxygen, so it's a polar end and it will bond to water. It doesn't actually have hydrogen bonding, but it will dissolve in water. So you have one end dissolve in water but won't dissolve the grease. The other end won't dissolve in water, but will dissolve the grease. And what it does in water then, 
The nonpolar end wants to get away from the water, so in water it will actually line up so that all the zigzag ends, and I'll put a negative sign, are together in like a sphere. And the polar ends, which I'm marking with minus signs, are facing out to the water. So the oil and grease gets trapped inside this sphere of soap glob, and yet the outside can dissolve in the water so that you can wash it away. Okay, so the oil and grease is in the middle, the water is on the outside, all the way around it. And that's how soap works, because it needs to dissolve in water, but it also needs to dissolve grease. Now let's look at capsaicin. Okay, capsaicin is the compound in spicy peppers. If you've ever eaten a hot pepper, like a habanero pepper, or even a jalapeno, and made your mouth burn, this is the molecule that's causing trouble, and the molecule is looks a little bit like this thing on the left. Okay, it's got a lot, it looks a lot like the soap in a way from this perspective. It has a polar end, which we are um, drawing as a circle, and it has a long hydrocarbon chain. Now, in your mouth and in other parts of your body, you have lipids in your cell membranes. You have a uh, what they call lipid bilayer, and a lipid looks like this. It also has a nonpolar polar end, and it has a polar end. It just happens to have two long nonpolar end, whereas the capsaicin has one nonpolar chain. All right, but the two look very similar, and remember, like dissolves like. So the capsaicin molecule likes to bond to your cells in your mouth and keep burning and burning and burning. And you might drink water to try to get rid of the capsaicin, but it doesn't work because it only can bond to the polar end, whereas the lipids in your mouth bond quite readily to the whole thing. So that's why when you get hot peppers in your mouth, water doesn't really help, all right, because the, it's not like water, it's like your cell membranes. What are the energetics of dissolving? Let's do an example of methanol in water, and we'll do a little energy diagram to show what happens as the dissolving process occurs. We'll start with a separate solution, or a separate container of methanol and water. Okay, methanol is the solute, we're calling water the solvent, and we have to do a couple things to get them together. First, we have to separate the methanol molecules from each other, and we're going to call that an energy of, of the solute. And that energy will be the delta H for the solute, and that's the energy it takes to break up the solute. Okay, so let's draw a new diagram for the methanol, and let's put those three molecules as now separated. So there's some energy it takes to take them out of the liquid form and separate them into the gas form. Then we're going to do the same thing for the solvent. So we'll have a delta H for the solvent, and it may or may not be a similar value, so this isn't to scale. But delta H for the solvent Okay, it's going to take some energy to separate the water as well. So I'll show that as separate molecules. Okay, so we've turned each of the two sets of molecules into gas phase, and now we have to take those separate phases and mix them together in one container. All right, now the energy for doing that will be will be negative. Okay, we'll get a mixture back, and we'll go down, we'll call that delta H for the mixture, and that gets to some point. The diagram will be the two of them mixed, okay, the water and the methanol, all mixed together in a container, and that's the heat of mixing. The thing is, we don't know if that heat of mixing is going to be, in the drawing I just drew, that heat of mixing is less than the sum of the two 
delta H's to separate them, but it could be um, greater. You could also have delta H mixing be greater than the difference, the sum of the other two. So this is an or. The delta H may be greater than that. You may go down to a lower level. And then we can define the heat of solution as being start from the starting point to where we ended up. So if we ended up in this case, case one, our heat of solution would be positive. We'll call it delta H sol. That's positive, that'd be an endothermic process. And that happens, sometimes you dissolve something in, like you dissolve salt in water and it actually cools the solution down a little bit, gets a little bit colder. So that would be that case. But sometimes the delta H of solution is negative. Sometimes you dissolve something in water or any other solvent and it is um, gives off heat, it gets warmer. So you don't, so the the delta H for solution may be positive or negative, and again, that's going to depend on the relative energies of the heat of mixing compared to the heat of the separating the solvent and separating the solute. So we can say overall, the delta H of solution will depend on the size of the other delta H's. And those will be different for every different solute and solvent combination. Sometimes it's positive and sometimes it's negative. Finally, back to our original question of how much solute dissolves. We've talked about what determines how much will dissolve, but then now we, now we can talk about how much actually dissolves and how do we, how do we characterize that. Um, we use this value called the solubility, which I alluded to at the beginning. I said for sodium chloride it was 39 grams per 100 grams of water. Um, the units will vary. Okay, They might be something like that, grams per 100 milliliters of the solvent. Or you might do solubility in simple molarity or moles per liter. So they may vary. But basically, whenever your concentration that you have equals that solubility, and let's go to sodium chloride, which is 39. So if I have 39 grams of sodium chloride in 100 grams of water, I would say that I'm at the solubility. We call that a saturated solution. Um, whenever you have less than that, so if I have less than 39 grams of sodium chloride for 100 grams of water, then we would say that's an unsaturated. And in some cases, it is possible to at least temporarily create a solution that has more of a solute dissolved than is at equilibrium. Okay, and that is called a supersaturated solution. And as you can guess, it's not particularly stable. We say it's unstable. And you can't always make that, but some, under some conditions you can create a solution that is supersaturated and um, somewhat unstable. And that is the basics of solutions and solubility.